His Excellency has been a Kenya Foreign Service Officer for the over 30 years. Before his service in Ukraine, he served as an ambassador in Georgia and uh, prior to it as a Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary of State for European and Euro-Asian Affairs resp responsible for U.S. Uh, relations with Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. Uh, Mr. Teft holds a master's degree from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., one of the world-leading academic and research institutions, especially in the area of political science. Today, Mr. Teft uh, will devote his speech to democracy and innovation activity. Your Excellency, please take the floor. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the faculty, Mr. Rector. I have to get the microphones ready. Okay. And uh, members of the faculty, and uh, most of all, to the students. I remember the last time I was in this hall was last July, and I sat over there and listened to uh, my boss, the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, have, uh, give a very nice speech, but then have a real dialogue with the students. And she told me afterwards how much she enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know if any of you were here that day, but uh, <clears throat> if you were, it was pretty hard to know that that day, she got off the airplane at 5.30 in the morning, worked all day and had meetings with the leaders of your country, and then came in here at 6.30 when all of the rest of us were exhausted and gave a wonderful speech and a, a wonderful, had a wonderful dialogue with the students. And now that's my hope today as well. I'm going to speak for a little bit and uh, throw out some ideas to you. But then I look very much forward to your comments, to your... Uh, reactions and to your questions so that we can have uh, a, a dialogue on what I consider to be a very important topic for Ukraine and I think ultimately for all of you. My subject today is democracy and why it is so important for Ukraine. Now you might ask yourself why is the American ambassador coming to the Kyiv Polytechnic Institute to give a speech on democracy. Well, as I hope to show you, I believe that democracy is vital for this country in and of itself, but it is also vital for the development of entrepreneurship and innovation in Ukraine. It is vital for the economic future of Ukraine. And this is where you come in, because many of you will be the future technologists and scientists and innovators in this wonderful country. I believe that your success and Ukraine's success as a nation competing in a globalized economy are intertwined. They're intertwined with the successful evolution of democracy and modernization in this country. Let me try to explain by first painting a bit of the backdrop to any discussion about democracy in today's world. Some of you may remember, if not personally, they're studying it, an article that was written by the American scholar Frank Fukuyama at the end of the Cold War. He declared in a 1989 article in Foreign Affairs magazine that we had reached the end of history. In a later book called The End of History and the Last Man, Fukuyama argued that the progression of human history as a struggle between ideologies was largely at an end. He predicted the eventual global triumph of political and economic liberalism. He wrote, and here I'm quoting from his book, what we may be witnessing today is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization, the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. That was a very optimistic assessment. 
The very next year, in 1993, another distinguished American scholar, a professor at Harvard named Samuel Huntington, published an equally famous and controversial essay in Foreign Affairs magazine called The Clash of Civilizations. Huntington, who later also expanded his thoughts into a book, argued that societies are divided along cultural lines, Western, Eastern, Islamic, etc., and that there is no one universal civilization. Each cultural block in the world adheres to its own distinct set of values. When he looked at this part of the world, when he looked at Eastern Europe, Huntington believed that Ukraine and Russia largely belonged to the same block of civilization. Therefore, they were likely to find common cause, however uneasy. But Huntington also raised whether the, West, the question of whether the Western parts of this country, which had longer experience as part of Poland, Lithuania, and Austria, might not belong culturally to Western European bloc, and might even choose to split from Eastern Ukraine. This is a very speculative article back in 1993. Well, in the past two decades of Ukrainian independence, many people have seized, many political scientists have seized on the idea, on Huntington's analysis, to suggest that somehow Ukraine lies on the fault line between the West and the East, between democracy and a more authoritarian model. For many, this school of thought suggests that Ukraine must either embrace the West in democracy or embrace the East and perhaps fall short of democracy. Well, Huntington's views have come recently come back into prominence, and the reason I mention them today, of course, is that the outbreak of revolution in many parts of the Arab world have raised questions about the core of his thesis. Many have now argued, with the experience that we have seen in Tunisia and Egypt and Libya, and today we're seeing in Syria and other places, They've argued that Huntington was wrong, that the cultural context of a civilizational choice is not the fundamental point. The fundamental point is the desire of all peoples, of every people, including people in the Arab world, to live their lives in a free and democratic society. In an excellent March 4th essay in the New York Times, the American columnist David Brooks argued succinctly that Huntington was wrong. He wrote the following, and I'm going to quote it directly. In retrospect, I would say that Huntington committed the fundamental attribution error. That is, he ascribed to traits the qualities that are actually determined by context. Huntington argued that the people in the Arab lands do not hunger for pluralism and democracy, in the way these things are understood in the West. But it now appears as though they were simply living in circumstances that did not allow those individual spiritual hungers to come to the surface. But it seems clear that many people in the Arab nations do share a universal hunger for liberty. They feel the presence of universal human rights and they feel insulted when they are not accorded them. Well, I think you can make the similar point about other places, including Ukraine. I think Huntington's artificial division of Western and Eastern Europe was wrong. Sure, there are obviously historical differences and traditions, but I believe that whatever Ukraine's ultimate relationships with its neighbors are, whether they be West or the East, and I should say I'm convinced the majority of Ukrainians want to be part of Europe and the European Union, I think Ukrainian people have made it abundantly clear in the last 20 years that they do desire freedom, they do desire independence, and they do desire a democratic future. In short, Ukrainians aspire to that universal right, that universal dream of all people to determine their own future. Here we get to another fundamental point. I think democracy and modernization go hand in hand. Democracy and economic development 
go hand in hand. This is as true in Ukraine as it is anywhere in the world. In an important article in Foreign Affairs magazine in 2009, two professors, Ronald Engelhart from the University of Michigan in the United States and Christian Veltzel from the Jacobs University in Bremen, argued that there is a growing body of empirical evidence, and here I'm quoting, which supports the idea that economic and technological development bring a coherent set of social and political changes. And they also bring growing mass demands for democratic institution and more responsive behavior by elites. These changes make democracy increasingly likely to emerge while also making war less acceptable to publics. A little later in their article, they write the following. The desire for freedom and autonomy are universal attributions, are universal aspirations. They may be subordinated to the needs for subsistence and order when survival is precarious, but they take increasingly high priority as survival becomes increasingly secure. The basic motivation for democracy, the human desire for free choice, starts to play an increasingly an important role. People put growing emphasis on free choice in politics, and they demand the civil and political liberties and the democratic institutions. So what does it mean for Ukraine to be a mature democracy? How would democracy benefit Ukrainians in practical terms? When President Bill Clinton visited Ukraine as President of the United States 11 years ago, he spoke to a very large crowd on St. Michael's Square, and he, he said a number of things which I believe still very much apply to Ukraine. President Clinton said the following, I know you have faced disappointments and your dream is not complete. You have your vote, but you may ask, will it lead to having a real positive impact? You have your freedom, but you may ask, will it lead to a better future? I ask you to look around you, from Lithuania to Poland to the Czech Republic. Those who chose open societies and open markets like you started out with sacrifice, but they ended up with success. You are on your way. Ukraine has so much of what it takes to succeed in the global information age, strong universities, an educated society, and partners willing to stand with you. All you need now is to stay on the course and pick up speed. Open the economy, strengthen the rule of law, promote civil society, protect the free press, break the grip of corruption." End quote. Well, I would argue that many people who were standing in the square that day, listening to Bill Clinton, got the message. Of the requirements that President Clinton listed, one of the areas in which Ukraine has had the most success in the past decade is building a stronger civil society. NGOs and other civic organizations continue to offer influential voices in guarding freedoms and encouraging needed reforms in this society. Thanks in large part to their efforts, government and opposition parties recently came together in a rare effort to draft and pass, overwhelmingly, a new law guaranteeing Ukrainians access to official information. Ukrainian society will have to remain engaged to ensure that this law is fully implemented but it will be an important tool in the hands of journalists, NGOs, scholars, and all citizens to expose and help to end corruption, eliminate waste, and to build reform. But clearly there are areas where Ukraine has not yet lived up to the promise of democracy sketched out by former President Clinton. And here we come back to the question of what, Ukraine, what democracy means for Ukraine today. I should be clear, when I speak about democracy, I include the liberal values that we in the United States, and I think in Europe, associate with democratic institutions and norms. These include freedom of speech and assembly, freedom to participate in fair elections, 
and freedom from unreasonable search of one's home and seizure of one's property. These are among the basic requirements for all democracies. But they are also the elements of democracy that ensure the inalienable rights that one of our great leaders, Thomas Jefferson, wrote about in our Declaration of Independence. You'll remember he spoke about the importance of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, I don't think you need me to elaborate any further today on freedom of speech and assembly, as these issues are very vigorously discussed in modern Ukrainian society. But I would like to touch on a number of other key points, and this is where I'm going to try to bring it back to you as the students here at KPI. While it is clear that without rule of law, there is no democracy, I would argue that rule of law is essential to ensuring modernization and economic development. Ensuring the sanctity of private property is essential to a successful modern society. So too are independent courts, independent judiciary. Courts stand as a bulwark against the arbitrary seizure, both the outright taking of freedom or possessions by authorities or the more th subtle theft of corruption. Returning to Thomas Jefferson, we have the following admonition. Jefferson wrote, and I'm quoting here, in every government on earth, there is some trace of human weakness, some germ of corruption and degeneracy, which cunning will discover and wickedness insensibly open, cultivate and improve. Every government degenerates when trusted to the rulers of the people alone. An independent judiciary that will enforce the laws against the ruling class as well as the common man is essential in ensuring that government serves all the people and not just those who can seize and exploit positions of power. When only corrupt politicians and oligarchs who can curry special favors benefit from the structures of authority that should guarantee the rights of all, they rob not only from the present, they also steal from the future. When Intel and Dell were looking for a base for their European production a few years ago, they might well have considered the educated, hardworking populations in Kyiv or Odessa, but they chose a similarly educated, hardworking population in Łódź in Poland. Certainly Łódź enjoyed an advantage in that Poland is a member of the European Union, but another reason why investors place their money where they do is the calculation of which country is more likely to predictably protect contract rights. Foreign investors will avoid countries where there is a reasonable fear that their investments may be seized and contracts voided without recourse to the law. Similarly, and perhaps even more relevant to students such as yourselves in a leading technical university like KPI, is that independent courts and the rule of law in a democracy will help protect intellectual property rights. This in turn will encourage those with patentable ideas or creative output they wish to copyright to pursue those activities here in Ukraine rather than leaving for other countries. The phenomenon referred to as brain drain is not simply one in which educated leave poor countries for richer ones. It is often the case where they leave one country for another because it offers better opportunities to profit from their intellectual and creative endeavors. In Lviv, there is the headquarters of a company called Elix. Elix, did I got the right pronunciation? Got it. It was founded in 1991 and now has over 450 people working at multiple locations in Ukraine, in Poland, and even several offices in the United States. This company is doing high-end software development for U.S. companies, including providing innovative technical support for various shows on Broadway and in Las Vegas. Alexei Skripnik, the founder and CEO, took part in a U.S. government exchange program back in the 1990s and has used what he learned from this experience to work with the U.S. Civilian Research and Development Foundation, which is also supported by an embassy grant 
I think totaling $200,000. He's supported by the Lviv City Administration and another Ukrainian entrepreneur to create and support an innovation center in Lviv to promote innovation and commercialization of science, similar to what you're trying to do here at KPI. Well, this is an example that I mentioned in the commercial sector that should be the rule in Ukraine, not the exception. The rule, not the exception. Seems to me that this is your challenge, the next generation, particularly innovators, scientists, engineers. This is your challenge. Those of you gathered here should be enabled to help build the future of Ukraine. You shouldn't be driven away to a foreign country to do that. It is up to the current leaders of this country to encourage you to do so by, in my view, delivering on the promises of democratic reform, judicial reform, and the fight against corruption. And it is up to you to lend your voice to those other voices in society which demand that authorities keep these promises that they have made. In a, in a democracy, that isn't just your right, it is your obligation and responsibility. Now in saying this, I'm well aware because I've talked to a lot of people in Ukraine, that many young people in this society often get frustrated or disillusioned when they get an education but no real job opportunity. I've talked to young people around this country who see no hope here and are tempted to want to leave and make your life elsewhere. This, of course, is your choice. You can do with whatever you wish. But I would recall for you a speech that had a big impact on me when I was roughly your age long, long time ago. Actually, it was 45 years ago. One of the great American politicians of the 20th century, Senator Robert Kennedy, went to South Africa during the apartheid period there and gave a speech to a group of students at Cape Town University. He urged those students to act on their ideals, to help the less fortunate, and to fight for democracy. His words, were inspirational then, and they're inspirational today. I'll quote. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Remember, he was speaking in apartheid South Africa. Well, in preparing to speak to you here today at KPI, I recalled those words. And I recalled what they meant to me as a young man, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Today, these words, which I remember from 45 years ago, are written on Robert Kennedy's tomb at Arlington National Cemetery in Washington. These words helped inspire my long career in public service, and I hope by sharing them with you today, they will inspire you as well. To find ways to contribute to the greatness of your country, whether you work in the public or private sectors when you finish your education, the choices made by you and your generation will prove decisive for the success of democracy, freedom, and ultimately the prosperity of this great country. These things do require rule of law and the elimination of corruption, both of which require that government be transparent and answerable to its people. Bobby Kennedy spoke in the same speech along that line, and here again I'm quoting. The essential humanity of man can be protected and preserved only when government must answer, not just to the wealthy, not just to those of a particular religion, not just those to, of a particular race, but to all of the people. And even government by the consent of the governed, as in our own constitution, must be limited in its power to act against people. It is not realistic or hard-headed to solve problems and take action unguided by ultimate moral aims and values, although we all know some who claim that it is so. Of course, to adhere to standards, to idealism, to vision in the face of immediate dangers takes great courage and great self-confidence. But we also know that only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. I'll say it again. Only those who dare to fail greatly
can ever achieve greatly. Government must ultimately answer to the people, and the people must not allow arguments that rule of law and democratic principles should be sacrificed for expedience, even if the stated goal appears desirable. The great American poet and essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson said in the 18th century, the wise know that foolish legislation is a rope of sand which perishes in the twisting, that the state must follow and not lead the character and progress of the citizen, and they only who build on ideas build for eternity. While many of Ukraine's educated youth have chosen to leave the country to seek their fortune, at least temporarily, the bold choice, I believe, is to stay and apply yourselves to raising the level of private enterprise, innovation, rule of law, and democracy in this country. Think of Tara Shevchenko's Cossack, who sought his fate abroad only to be left longing for a way to return to his own land and people, watching with yearning the cranes flying over the sea toward Ukraine. Think today of the educated Polish, Indian, or Taiwanese youth returning to their home countries to devote their energies and knowledge in high-tech jobs which contribute to the growth of opportunity in the lands of their birth. The choice lies before you. The challenge lies before you. I wish you all the very best, and I hope for your success in building not only great careers as innovators and scientists in this country, but in building a thriving, democratic Ukraine ruled by law. Thank you very, very much. I don't usually give lectures. I hope it wasn't too, too deep. I, I'm just a diplomat. We don't, we're not allowed to give lectures very much. But I would welcome your thoughts, your comments, your questions, your ideas. This is the best part of the day. Как можно связать вопросы инновационного, инновационного развития и... How could you link together the issues uh, I was talking to the rector about this because he, he showed me through the, uh, the Hall of Science or your, uh, your technological center here and I was very impressed and he told me that, that you were, uh, that in planning that the, the university looked hard at some of the universities around the world including in my country that have had great success in trying to stimulate innovation and, and market innovation, commercialize it. And I was actually very impressed with what he's doing. But we also talked about one of the issues that I mentioned in my speech, which is the question of intellectual property rights. Because you can be the smartest person in the world, you can have the most brilliant ideas, but unless your idea is protected, it can't be stolen by somebody else, you'll eventually have nothing. This is a big problem in the world. And it's something that I and my colleagues at the embassy work on every day. And to be very honest, I think there are some severe problems in Ukraine with regard to this. And I'm not just talking about going down to the Rimic and buying uh, some uh, piece of Microsoft software or buying a, uh, a CD. What I'm talking about is making sure that the ideas of Ukraine scientists are protected in this country and that they, that they can be commercialized and the value of that idea through its commercialization goes to the inventor, goes to the university that helped develop that idea. This is something that we Americans have learned is absolutely critical in the world if we're going to be successful. And it's absolutely critical in a globalized society, a globalized economy to be able to, to do this. Without that, you can innovate and innovate and innovate, but it's never going to be successful because somebody's going to steal your idea and you're not going to get the value out of that. So that's why intellectual property rights, I would argue, is one of the absolute building blocks. But then there's a lot of other things, some of which you're doing here, which is having a university work hard for its professors, its faculty, its students to be able to market those ideas in this globalized, competitive, world economy. I was glad to see 
The General Electric and a number of other American companies are here either working with or exploring possible cooperation. Uh, this, is, this is very good. It was very encouraging to me. I know a lot more needs to be done, but this is actually a, a critical, uh, critical step, bringing people together like this, which the rector is trying to do. You quoted Bill Clinton, who stated that open markets foster to democracy. A portion of Ukrainian population thinks differently. For instance, there are some who think that that will worsen the situation, make the situation worse, because number of foreign goods already are cheaper than Ukrainian goods of the same type uh, produced in Ukraine. Could you think about any good example of a European country which made this step and was successful and really fostered the economic growth? I think the best example that I know of is right next door, Poland. Mm -hmm. Now, Poland is still in, in the progress of uh, becoming uh, more competitive. But if, if my memory serves, and Jim, Jim can correct me if I'm wrong here, I think the per capita income in Poland is now, what, uh, three times as high as it is in Ukraine, isn't it? Yeah. Now, I understand Absolutely. Poland is part of the European Union now, and there's got to be some benefit to that. But Poland went through a period of very tough reforms, some real sacrifice to be able to do this. And th to be sure, there is a certain amount of uh, faith you have to have to do this, to be able to change. Uh, for example, I mean, the debate now about the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union. I understand there are lots of industries here that would love to protect their products, but they can sell those products mainly here and in Russia. If you're going to be competitive in a global economy, you've got to be able to sell those products in Europe and the United States. Now, some countries started this process earlier than Ukraine, but I think it's critical, and I, I have no illusions about how hard this is, this is and this might be. There's no guarantees here. But I think that you have to be able to develop products which you can sell around the world. And by products, I don't mean, you know, microphone like this necessarily. I'm talking about intellectual products, ideas, techniques, ways to do things, ways to provide better services. Uh, when I was ambassador in Lithuania, there was a, an, a, an American company in Kansas City. It was an insurance company. And the, one of the executives just happened to meet my predecessor as ambassador, and he told them about the develop, this wonderful, again, technological university there that had these great computer programmers. Well, one thing led to another, and they set up a system where this insurance company had all of its software and all of its processing, this is 10 years old now, so it's a little old, all done in Lithuania via a, a big uh, open computer line in the internet. It was an example for me when I went down there, there were about, it was still pretty small, 50, 50 uh, young Lithuanians, not much older than most of you, who were basically working for an American company in Kansas City via the internet and via their using their technological, their software skills. That, that's the kind of thing that has to be, not just in information technology, but I just use that. We saw over here at the uh, Technological Center some innovative small uh, machines that are being used for healthcare, for uh, uh, syringes. Uh, the future in nanotechnology is huge. And the way you do that is get connected to similar centers, other businesses around the world. The day where a country can just say, we're just going to produce for our own, our own good, I think that, that, that's going. And that's, that's true for my country just as much as it is for Ukraine. Uh, dear uh, Ambassador of United States, dear uh, sir, uh, I present here, uh, represent here some of professors and uh, former students of KPI. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very, we, I am honored to listen and to hear you in the, this hall. In this hall was uh, 
a great scientist, uh, Dmitry Mendeleev, who was uh, the chair of examination commission in the first issue of our specialist. But I wa want to say about uh, connection between scientists, uh, KPI, and uh, American. And I uh, may say you that uh, last year we try to connect uh, with, uh, to have some uh, proposal, scientific proposal with uh, uh, state general, uh, state uh, foundation of Ukraine and National Scientific Foundation of USA. Mm -hmm. And uh, we failed because we have no, not much time to uh, be in time. But I think that uh, after your visit in our university, we have uh, more real, real pos uh, possibilities to have some scientific connections, uh, some scientific treaties, mm -hmm. and uh, mm, to realize our proposals mm -hmm. uh, with uh, universities of United States. And I hope that uh, uh, amb uh, ambassador of United States will uh, help help mm -hmm. us. May we have such hopes? Yes, I hope so. I, I will tell you very honestly that, how shall I say this? The idea in the past, I know in Eastern Europe, because I found this when I served in Russia and other places, is we would have work or, or, or projects that would come from the connections between the National Science Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences. The way we Americans work is not so much through organizations as we work through individuals in the organizations. And I think just talking to some of the professors that I just did uh, before coming here, some of them have built those personal connections. And because what happens on our side is you have to get the money for the project. And uh, the, the, they don't just hand it out, it's a competitive deal. So you've really got to have a professor or a friend or a colleague in the States and that can go out there and, and fight for it and can get it and can sell and get the, and can get the, uh, the stipend or get the award to be able to finance the project. Now, I say that to you not as a dodge. We'll do everything we can at the embassy to help, but a lot of it has to be working these individual connections that we can then try to support. It's, it's a little bit different, to be very honest, than what I've, that I've found in other countries here in Eastern Europe. It's, uh, we're a little less organization than we are more on the individual building connections. Thank you. And I, I, and I uh, want to say that uh, democracy is very important for Ukraine, and it seems to me that United States are, uh, is a very uh, important factor to democracy will be in Ukraine indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Taft. Uh, I would like to ask uh, what specifically should be done in Ukraine to increase our level of development? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. These are the easy questions and the hard ones come later then, huh? is that? <laughs> um, you know, there's no one model that fits every country. You have to adapt it. And, you know, I, I Ukraine has done a lot of good things. There's no question. I, I, I'm not uh, saying that they haven't. But what I was trying to address today was not so much the economic development side per se, but the, the importance for these democratic values and these democratic institutions to stimulate that development. In other words, you cannot have, it, it kind of goes both ways, you cannot have good economic development and modernization without democratic methods and the things that I discussed, from protecting intellectual property to courts to the rest of it. And I think there's a lot in that area that still has to be done. President Yanukovych has spoken quite extensively about the need for reform, and there are a number of reforms pending. We at the embassy spend a lot of time. I have staff at the embassy from different departments of our government trying to help Ukraine develop these, these laws 
that will be critical to becoming a part, to helping Ukraine become a more competitive member of, uh, of the international uh, economic community. Uh, I'll go back also to the, the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. You know, I know this isn't going to be easy for Ukraine. There's going to be sacrifice. There's going to be losses in the short term, but hopefully gains in the medium to the long term. I think having access to the European market is probably the single most important thing right now that, can, that Ukraine can aspire to. It's such a huge, huge market. It is for us. It's our biggest trading partner, no question, for the United States. And I think it's vital, and I, I think that the government is doing the right thing in negotiating that agreement and trying to get it done this year, as President Yanukovych has said. I think that's important for this country and probably as important strategically as anything that you could possibly do. But then you've got a lot of the specific laws and you've got to develop a system, an economic system, where individual entrepreneurs, small and medium business, can be encouraged to develop ideas. And whether this is scientific or if it's just selling something, you've got to have the confidence that you're going to be able to do this business, you're going to make a decent living from it, and it's not going to be taken away from you. And then the other big thing, which I don't need to talk to you about, is corruption. Corruption steals in the end. It may be subtle in some ways, but it steals from the people. It robs the people of the country. And corruption needs to be addressed. It, as I tried to say in my remarks, every country in the world has it. We have at least three, if not four, congressmen in the United States now in jail, in jail for corruption, because they were caught taking money or appropriating money, and we, we put them in jail. Now, th that doesn't mean we don't have corruption and people get away with it. it. I'm sure it happens. But I think any country that's going to be competitive in the world, and you can look at the statistics, you have to address the issue of corruption because in the end it steals from you and it undercuts the very purpose of modernization. Ми сьогодні говоримо про демократію в Україні, про її важливість розвитку. Today we are talking about democracy in Ukraine and the development of democracy in Ukraine. That's why my question is as follows. What kind of problems do you see in Ukraine which hamper uh, development of democracy in Ukraine, which actually prevents Ukraine from achieving really big success in this area? I think I mentioned some of them. I think I think one of the key things that this country needs, and it's hard to develop when you don't have a long tradition of it, is an independent judiciary. And I'm, this is important for the citizens of this country, for each one of you, for protecting your rights, but it's also critical for, uh, for example, foreign trade, foreign investment. One of the, the biggest complaints I hear all the time from American businesses here is, corruption. And what they mean is they'll be working with someone and everything will be going great and the money will start to be earning and then all of a sudden the partner will take them to a court and basically get a court ruling by paying a little bit under the table to, uh, to uh, block that money or to take over the firm. There's a lot of different examples like this. You've got to have, if you're a foreign investor, and this country needs, needs foreign investment a lot, uh, you've got to have the confidence that you're trying to do that. Just as you, if you start a business when you graduate from this university, let's say you're, you're going into some kind of software, you've got to be able to be sure that you're not going to have your ideas, your business, hijacked by some unscrupulous other person. And in order to be able to do that, you've got to have a court that you can go to to be able to get justice for you, to get your rights protected. I think that's one of the fundamental points. Um, I think that uh, uh, expanding opportunity is another really important, this isn't so much a human right, but it's actually a really important issue for, especially for all of you who are at this fine institution, but you're eventually gonna have to go out and get jobs and you want a system where opportunities are presented. Nobody's gonna give you a job in this competitive world market. 
Nobody's going to come and say, here it is, here's your life, is all planned for you, you know, just take this job. You're going to have to go out and compete. This is what we do in the United States, and it's hard. Sometimes you have to fail. And one of the great things about my country, I don't like to fail. You know, just ask anybody who, I, who works for me. I get angry when, when I fail or somebody on my staff fails. But the fact is, you're usually not trying hard enough if you don't make some mistakes. That's why Bobby Kennedy said in the quote that I read to you, you know, unless you f try to fail greatly, you're never going to achieve greatly. It seems like a paradox, but in fact it's true. You have to make, especially as young people, you have to make a, an attempt, it seems to me, to try to find what it is that you want to do. Um, I have two daughters who are now older than you are, and they've tried different jobs. You know, I'm one of these guys, I started 40 years ago as a diplomat, and first time I got it right. I made it, I, you know, I just, for my whole life I've done this. But many people in the States move from job to job. They go from one area to another, often for another opportunity or more salary, but often because they didn't get it right the first time. You gotta be able to do that, and you have to have opportunities to be able to, to try to do that. I've talked to the Prime Minister about this, about education and the importance of providing these opportunities for all of you. And uh, I think these are, these are critical, critical issues, as much as some of the, uh, uh, the democratic and, and uh, human values that I talked about before. Thanks. Thank you very much. My question will be in Ukrainian. Uh, getting back to the topic of innovation and innovative development, what kind of factors should Ukraine engage in order to achieve the new level of innovations in this country? What do we need to do? Obviously, you need a good education, which I think you're getting here. Uh, I haven't sat in in your classrooms, but I know I've talked to the rector and some of your professors, and having the opportunity to, to get the fundamentals right. The rector showed me the uh, students on pictures on the wall outside who've competed in international competitions and obviously done very well, and that's an indication of the quality of education here. Um, I think what we have found in America, though, once you get past education, is you have to look at the, this opportunity. Let me kind of put it another way. You know, when people, when foreign leaders look at America, everybody th and thinks about innovation and technology, they think about Silicon Valley. And everybody thinks, okay, take me to Silicon Valley so I can see where you have organized all of this innovation. Well, I don't know if any of you have been out to Silicon Valley, but there really isn't a Silicon Valley. It's a bunch of towns around Stanford University and other universities where you have a lot of very smart people, some of whom have uh, developed te technologies. One of the places, if you ever go, you should go visit, is Bill Packard. You know uh, Hewlett Packard HP computers? Bill Packard created the computer in his garage. And so you can actually go to the garage of his house today. They're going to probably make this into a national historic site someday because that's where he created the kind of personal computer that all of us have used for, for many years. Silicon Valley is a state of mind. Innovation is a state of mind. Um, how many of you seen this movie, the, the one about Facebook? What's the name? Social Network. Have you seen this movie, The Social Network? Yes, about the kid who created Facebook? Yeah, yeah. Miles Zuckerberg. Absolutely. Miles is... It, what? Yeah, yeah. What did he have? He had nothing. He had an idea. He had an idea. And, you know, he, may, he was able to market it. It wasn't... He didn't always have an easy road to do it. But it's that idea, and I think it's the environment in which you can not only come up with those ideas, and that's partly the role of education, but it's then having a, a, an environment where you can go out and get uh, financing for what may seem a crazy idea. 
You know, I mean, somebody, I was told a story one time where Bill Gates, you know, dropped out of Harvard. He didn't even finish. And he went to, uh, can't remember, he went to get a loan to help him develop this thing he called software. And the banker said, what? Software? What, what the hell is software? He says, well, you know, it's computers. And the banker didn't even know what the computer was about, let alone the operating system of a computer. He said, I want to develop operating system for the computer. What? You want money for this? No, I mean, I, I, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But it's, it's actually hilarious when he tells this story because nobody had a concept of what an operating system was for a computer when he started doing this when he was, what, 19 years old, dropped out of Harvard. I, I also saw an interview one time with his father, and they said, were you worried? He said, you're damn right I was worried. This kid drops out of the best university in the country. I'd worked my life to get him into this school. And he says, I'm out of here. I'm going to go develop operating systems for computers. He, he was really worried that the kid wasn't going to succeed. Now, what is he? He's quite apart from being one of the great geniuses of our time. He's one of the wealthiest men, if not the wealthiest man in the entire world. What I'm trying to describe is, is developing an atmosphere, a way of thinking conducive to getting ideas and then trying to be able to, to market those ideas. That's why I was asking the rector about how you have set this up here at the university to market ideas. If you guys come up with a smart idea or one of the faculty comes up with a smart idea, how do you get that into the commercialization process? Not easy. We, we've had trouble in the States. MIT in the Boston is one of the best at doing this. But uh, it's, it takes real skill to do this, to, to get the innovation and then to find a way to, to capitalize it, to commercialize it, uh, to make that innovation into something that's, that, uh, that, that, that all of society can use. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Very, uh, very short que questions. Uh, is it, Mr. Ambassador, is it uh, possible to build democracy uh, with a hard and difficult tax system? Tax system? Hmm. Now you're getting into issues that we're wrestling with in the United States. Tax systems and democracy. Um, listen, I've spent most of my diplomatic career, at least the last 30 years, working in this part of the world. I've served in uh, Moscow and Vilnius and Tbilisi and here, and I've worked in Washington. I was in charge of Eastern European policy for a while. And I understand, I think pretty well after all of this time, how hard it is for these societies to change. Ukraine has had its independence for 20 years. You know, for many of you, that's your whole life. But 20 years in the scheme of historic change is a very small amount of time. And I sometimes think that we Americans expect too much change too fast. But then as soon as I think that, I meet a young person in the society who says, we need faster change. We need to move faster than we are. So I under, my point is I understand that it's hard to make adjustments, especially for your parents and grandparents who lived uh, in a previous kind of system. But I think that you have to develop not only a way of thinking and change thinking, but also institutions. I think that taxes, and I'm, I, I say that as a general point, but to come back to your specific point, I think actually the fewer taxes you can get the better off you are. I will offer up to you Georgia where I served before. Georgia has pursued a whole raft of reforms including many things that I know uh, officials in government and outside are looking at here to introduce in Ukraine. 
yeah, Ukraine is 10 times as big as Georgia, but the things that have to change, like the ease of doing business, registering a com company, uh, having a flat tax rate at a predictable level and knowing that that's all you're going to pay, that you're not going to have the tax authority come around and say, well, I don't agree with that, I think you need to pay a little more. Those are critical things that Georgia has done, which I think can be a lesson for everyone in this society. And I know the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, many others have gone to Georgia to look at exactly what Georgia has achieved. Um, again, it's a smaller country, but I think they've got the, the recipe. They've got the right way of doing this. How you structure taxes to encourage innovation is another thing. There's uh, lots of ideas out there. I know a lot of places in Eastern Europe, in Lithuania, for example, we had a technology park, and they basically passed a tax law that allowed any company to start, any Western company could come in and start a business and get forgiven for like two years or something, three years. I'm not an expert enough to say that one method of doing that is better than another. Sometimes that works to encourage businesses to get started, but sooner or later those, those businesses have to be on their feet, they have to be surviving, they have to be doing well enough so that they can continue, uh, they can start paying taxes. Because after all, it's business that feeds the, that, that, that provides the wherewithal for government to be able to operate. Um, I think tax policy is a critical way of encouraging innovation and investment. And uh, I don't have a specific formula to suggest to you today for Ukraine, but I'm sure there are people out there who could probably do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, good day. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering, you know, I was sitting here and listening to you, and this is my pleasure. Thank you very much for your uh, speech. and. Uh, Actually, I thought about that I may a little step out of the circle in this democracy and everything because um, people here are technologists, they are innovators, they are youth, and youth is the mover of the progress. I know this, and you agreed with this uh, by your examples and everything. And, uh, uh, but actually, here is a lot of people, a lot of people in Ukraine that are not technologists and they're not economists or politicians or diplomats, but they want to bring uh, some profit to, to country, to our country. I want to, but I don't know how. For example, I'm the linguist, and here are uh, um, a lot of other people. Uh, I can just show you um, people from my faculty. Raise your arms, please. <laughs> so we got the linguistic faculty well this, represented. Thank you very much. This is, yes, and the problem is, um, like other youth, like other people here, we don't know how can I bring profit to, um, to my country because I, I don't know anything about technology. I don't know. My job is to translate or interpret, and this is the question. Am I useful or something? People here, are they useful? Absolutely, you're useful. <laughs> Absolutely. The, uh, some people here, I have their earphones on, they wouldn't understand me without the gentleman sitting in the back back there doing the interpreting. Because as much as I try to learn Ukrainian, I'm turning out to be a pretty, pretty bad failure. My, my wife says my brain is all mixed up from learning a lot of other languages in the past. No, I think, I think uh, your particular skill, and I, I admire your English, it was very good. It was almost, uh, we would say colloquial English. It sounded like an American almost to me. Uh, I, I think you can play a critical role. Now, obviously, the best thing would be is to find one of these smart guys here who's going to be a super, you know, world-famous nuclear physicist, but who doesn't yet speak English, and then you become his interpreter for the rest of his life, and he'll be, you'll be okay. You, no, I'm joking. I'm teasing you. <clears throat> we have at our embassy uh, some extraordinary Ukrainian employees who work on a whole variety of different issues but who have these extraordinary English language skills. Because my, my Ukrainian is so bad, I have to take them to meetings with Ukrainian officials who, they don't, uh, who don't speak any English. <clears throat> and I've watched them move from Ukrainian to Russian to English just like that, fast, fast, fast. Uh, I think it's an absolutely critical part of 
this part of the world, and I think it will be for the, for the future. There's a lot of people here who still don't speak English, despite the educational system. Um, I guess I would just say one other thing, and that is, you know, think big. Think, think, don't just think of the narrow skills that you've acquired here. You're obviously, you wouldn't be able to speak English as well without having real intelligence. I'm always marveling at, uh, at people who study for one thing and then end up doing something different. Last week I was talking to Deputy Foreign Minister uh, Pablo Klimkin, who is responsible at the Foreign Ministry for uh, American and European affairs. He's a brilliant diplomat, wonderful guy. He's a diplomat. You know, you know what his degree is in? Nuclear physics. Last week, the Prime Minister of Lithuania is here, Janus uh, Andrus Kabilius. I know him from when I was ambassador there. He's spent his whole life in politics, and you know what his degree is in? PhD in nuclear physics. My point is that life sometimes gives you choices, sometimes presents you opportunities that may not sound like it's particularly what you've thought of. Don't just keep in your, I mean, I hope you find a job in whatever it is and get started, but keep an open mind because you may find, I've, I've seen interpreters who work for me in other countries go off and become business people because their, their language skills are so good and they understand the, the, the business game so well that they're hired by foreign companies or even companies in, in their own country. This has happened in Russia and Lithuania to represent them and they become business people. I don't know what you want to do, but my point to you is think big. Uh, we have this expression in English, I don't know if you've ever heard, think outside the box. In other words, we have a, you have like a box is where you're, you think all the time, break the box, think outside the box. Thank you very Does much. that help you? Uh, I guess yes, but. If I could get you a job, you'd be better, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, the problem's not in the job, because I think if a person knows something, um, he or she will get a good job and everything, but uh, for example, um, people, uh, they sometimes, you know, they don't think big, and I didn't think big when I decided to be an interpreter. I just thought that I liked something, and I know the people here are good technologists, and they like technology, and they may uh, be useful for the technology and bring some... Uh, uh, innovations and profits, and I think if somebody uh, from t the technological level and from technological faculty, um, I don't, uh, maybe if he is very, um, he has a great intellect or um, intelligence, he would be useful even in business or something. And if not, if he, if he just knows what he does and anything else, uh, this is uh, this is the thing. I mean, not every person here wants to be. Um, Wants to, wants to be a jack of all trades. He just wants to be one narrow. <laughs> if you want to be one narrow, go go get what you want to get. That's all you can do. But I'm just saying that. Excuse me. I find that a lot of times life gives you a choice or gives you an opportunity that you maybe didn't think about. I tell you one more story. Some people ask me why did I become a diplomat. And they thought, you know, from the time I was like five years old, I wanted to be a diplomat. Mm -hmm. I was, after my third year at the university, I was like many Americans, I went to Europe, and I was riding around on the train seeing all of the beautiful sights. And one night I was on a train going from Paris to Barcelona, because I was trying to save money so I didn't have to buy a hotel room or a hostel, so I was on the train all night. And my uh, roommate and I, uh, met two girls and we were sitting and talking about what we were going to become. You know, what did you want to do with your life? What career did you want? And I said, I really don't know. I think I'll maybe be a teacher, but I really don't know. Because I didn't. It's the honest truth. And one of them said to me, have you ever thought about the Foreign Service, the Diplomatic Corps? And I honestly said to them, what's the Foreign Service? I'm 20 years old. Anyway, you can see me now, after 40 years, I found something that I liked. I, saw, I found something that I was good at that I never even thought about before I was 20. But 
I know people who wanted to be diplomats since they were five years old. Their dad was a diplomat and that's all they wanted to be and they go get it. They were that one thing and that's what they wanted to do. Everybody's different. Thank you, we are. I mean, all right. It really helps because... <laughs> yeah, it's okay, whichever, I'm good. I'm good. One more question, please. 30% of GDP of Ukraine are generated by metallurgic industry. Do you think this sector should be private or state-owned, as an example of Krivorish style in Ukraine? Do you think this plant should be private or state-owned? Uh, now you're trying to get me into trouble. Uh, I generally believe that uh, privatization is the, important, is the most important thing. I know every society has state-owned institutions, but I think uh, private sector is the best way to, uh, uh, to advance economically. It's uh, something I believe is an American in general, and I'm not talking about any specific companies or, or, uh, or facilities here. I would say that I think one of the things I've talked about with many Ukrainian political leaders, and that includes people who are in government now and people who are in the opposition, and the importance of developing in this society different kinds of uh, industries. Uh, you know, I mentioned in my speech the uh, software company out in Lviv. I think that's critical, developing those capabilities in this society so that the economy is more diversified and not just dependent on, on uh, metals and chemicals is absolutely critical for the future. And that's why, as you'll see in my speech, I've talked about developing those kinds of, uh, uh, of, of, of technologies and industries and why I'm here today because I think it's important what KPI is doing to not only educate all of you but also to help develop ideas, to market ideas, drawing on the vast technological and, and skilled uh, faculty and others who are here. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Your question, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Taft. I would like to say that all the examples that you've named and all organization and personalities, they were from uh, large cities such as Kyiv, Lvov, Odessa, and so on. But let's be honest, Ukraine's vast majority of people live in small towns and villages and their political and citizen awareness isn't that high, so they do not actually uh, know what democracy is and cannot give the accurate definition of that word. And as a result, they do not know how to use it or how to work with that knowledge. And what can you advise to Ukraine's government and us regular citizens of this country how to improve it and how to use that knowledge wisely because I do not think that the small part of Ukraine's um, people can push the whole country forward but it has to be done by its all inhabitants and they have to give it all to make Ukraine a really good place for living. Very good question. Very well said, too. Uh, I would say that, uh, no, you're right. Uh, there are a lot of people in this country who still have not had the opportunity that you have had for the education. I don't need to tell you the history of Ukraine and the tragedies of the 20th century, the things that some of your parents and grandparents went through, and great-grandparents. But the fact is Ukraine is now democratic and independent. It's trying to build a democracy. That's what Secretary Clinton talked about when she was at this lecture in, uh, last July. Building a democratic society takes time. And we Americans understand that. One of the things that I try to avoid is going around and sounding like I know everything and you don't know anything. You know, we're celebrating this year, and it just started in the United States, the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Now, our Civil War was a horrible, horrible thing. Over 600,000 people died, Americans killing Americans. It was terrible. So we Americans understand that building a democracy, 
building a set of rules of the game, democratic rules of the game, building an economy takes time. We've been through it. We've had good and we've had very bad. And so I, that's why I said before, I have no illusions that this is going to take time. But the fact is, in this information age, there's the opportunity to get out to people the, not only the ideas that some of the things we've talked about today, but to expand those, particularly through education. That's why education is so important. Uh, obviously, you, you have had the benefit of a good education. I don't know what family you come from, but I know a lot of families in Ukraine where the kids haven't had the opportunity that you've had. So we've got to try to build that opportunity, expand the opportunity, make education as good as it possibly can be, and keep building for the next generation. We Americans are often accused of being too optimistic. You know, we're Americans, so we're optimistic. Okay, we are. But the fact is, you've got to be hopeful and you've got to be optimistic that you can change things, that each individual can change things. That's what Bobby Kennedy was talking about in that quote that I gave you. He felt that each person could do that. Now, that's not an idea that is common that certainly came out of the communist system that this country was in. Today, you're in a democratic society. Each and every one of you can make the changes, can have an impact. And again, what Kennedy said is each one that's like throwing a pebble into, a, into a, a, a stream. Each one starts forming consecutive circles, you know, when the, when the water starts moving away. And you put all of those together and you can actually make a big change. It's going to take time. There's no question about it. It isn't going to come fast. There'll be mistakes, but then hopefully there'll be, there'll be efforts to move ahead. You guys are the ones who are going to have to do that. That's one of the reasons I came here today to try to tell you that, to encourage you. Thank you for an answer. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very right. much. Last question, one more, please. One more, one more. Can Good afternoon. I think we've had many things related rather to economy than democracy, but getting back to democracy and its consequences, uh, well, uh, democracy is uh, often associated with American style of life, and for many, your lifestyle is uh, an example that many people try to follow widely propagated through, say, American propaganda and American movies, for example. Do you think that there should be certain separation between something that I would call useful democracy and maybe wrong democracy? Maybe America is now too, has too much freedom, too much democracy. Maybe we should think about that side also. I don't think you can ever get too much freedom. I think that uh, what America provides is choice and opportunity. If you want, you can go see a film, an American film, but you don't have to go. I'm not forcing you to go. You actually have to pay to go see that film. That's your choice. In America, we have lots and lots of choices. and. Yes, American popular culture is very strong. I admit that. Uh, I think it has a beneficial effect overall on the world. I think our music, our films, and the rest of it do. I, there are certain parts of American popular culture that I don't like. I don't go watch uh, Transformers and some things like that. I don't want to offend anybody here, but there are certain parts of our culture I don't like. But it's my choice. I can turn the TV off. I cannot go see the film. It's a choice, what we have. It's out there, and, and you have a choice to do what you want. I think their fundamental desire of all people, as I said in my speech, to have freedom of choice, to have real democracy. But as you know, there are lots of different kinds of democratic systems in the world. We have not only different parliamentary kinds of systems, presidential systems, and the rest of it, but each country has to, in effect, derive its own system, its own, I would say, democratic rules of the game that's rooted in its own traditions.
But the fundamental is freedom. The fundamental is liberty and the opportunity for the people in that society to make the choices and then once they make them to be able to act on them and hopefully to succeed with them. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, thank you for today's meeting. You have sent very important messages to the youth uh, sitting in this hall and through mass media to the uh, uh, big Ukrainian universities community. Thank you very much. In uh, a memory of today's meeting, let me present you the lithograph which pictured the Igor Sikorsky. Uh, this man is uh, very symbolic for our countries mm -hmm. because uh, Igor Sikorsky was born in Kiev. He uh, studied in uh, Kiev Polytechnic uh, through 1907 to 1911. Uh, he became a big Ukrainian and then he became a big American. So uh, he is a symbolic man for us. Thank you Thank very so much, much, Mr. Ambassador. I want to thank all of you who are present. Best of luck to you. See you next.